The Life of Dwight L. Moody, Chapter 32, Northfield Conferences. The Northfield Christian Workers Conference, or as it is most more commonly known, the Northfield Bible Conference, to distinguish it from the Students' Conference held in the month of July, was the first of the summer gatherings assembled at Mr. Moody's home. This conference is of special interest as it expresses the spiritual development of the leader himself during the last 20 years of his ministry, and has proved to be one of the most prominent results that he achieved for the Christian Church. In making Northfield his home, Mr. Moody had a twofold object in view. As a father, he was always watchful of the physical as well as the moral welfare of his children. In the wholesome country life in which he himself and laid the foundations of a rugged constitution, he hoped to have his children equally benefited. The quiet of a small New England village, he thought, would also give him ample time for study, which he could not pursue while actively engaged in missions, and so, to bring about these two results, he decided to spend a few weeks each summer in his native town, at the same time visiting his mother. But public services had become a second nature to him, and even during his short season of relaxation, he was soon arranging meetings. On Sundays, he was usually away from home, preaching in neighboring towns, and the sight of Mr. Moody driving his old gray horse, Nellie Gray, was a familiar one to all the villages within a radius of 25 miles of Northfield. He was also a regular attendant at the midweek prayer meeting, helping to build up the local church in every way. During the second summer spent there, he began a series of informal Bible readings to which the neighbors were invited. These gatherings were held in his own house, and the attendants would frequently more than fill the limited accommodations of his dining room, numbers standing outside of the verandas by the open windows. Usually he would conduct these meetings himself, although sometimes a prominent visitor would be called upon to speak. In the spring of 1880, Dr. William, spelled B-L-A-I-K-I-E, of Edinburgh, visited Mr. Moody, and a week series of Bible readings was at once arranged to be held in the new recitation hall, now Reville Hall, of the Northfield Seminary. There were only occasional incidents of a deeper purpose, probably very indefinite, in his own mind at the time, but ultimately to find expression in the establishment of the Northfield Bible Conferences. In November 1879, he began an evangelistic mission in Cleveland, Ohio. The customary conference for Christian workers was held at the close of the series of evangelistic meetings, at which time the Reverend H.B. Hartzler gave an address on prayer for the church, which deeply impressed Mr. Moody, who sat immediately in front of the speaker. As Mr. Hartzler, that's H-A-R-T-Z-L-E-R, proceeded, Mr. Moody bowed his head in deep meditation for a time. Then, as if some plan of action had suddenly commended itself, he raised his head, flashed one quick glance at Mr. Hartzler, and resumed his position. At the close of the service, he at once drew Mr. Hartzler aside to, to the pastor's study and abruptly announced, I want you to come to Northfield next summer, will you? I want to have a meeting to wait on God and want you. This was rather too sudden for the other, who could not make an engagement so far ahead. On August 4th, the following year, however, he received the following letter. Northfield, Massachusetts. Dear Mr. Hartzler, In close you will find a circular that will explain itself, the call for the first conference. I got a start towards it in your city when you spoke at the convention there, um, about November 1st. Now, will you come? I want you above any other man in this nation. Do not say nay, but come and let us wait on God together. Truly yours, D.L. Moody. The call, entitled A Conver Convocation for Prayer, was as follows. Feeling deeply this great need, and believing that its reward is in reserve for all who honestly seek it, a gathering is hereby called to meet in Northfield, Massachusetts, from September 1st to 10th inclusively, the object of which is not so much to study the Bible, although the scriptures will be searched daily for instruction and promise, as for a solemn self-consecration, for pleading God's promises and waiting upon Him for a fresh anoint anointment of power from on high. Not a few of God's chosen servants from all our own land
again, and from overseas will be present with you to join in prayer and counsel. All ministers and laymen and those women who are helpers and laborers together with us in the kingdom and patience of our Lord Jesus Christ, and indeed all Christians who are hungering for intimate fellowship with God and for power to do His work are most cordially invited to assemble with us. It is also hoped that those Christians whose hearts are united with us in desire for this new endowment of power, but who cannot be present, will send us salutations and greetings by letter, that there may be concert of prayers with them through the land during these days of waiting. The Al Moody. Mr. Hutchler accepted the invitation and was urged by Mr. Moody to assume charge and preside at all the meetings. With this request, probably the only one he ever refused, Mr. Moody, he positively declined to comply, and Mr. Moody was obliged to assume the leadership himself. In later years, Mr. Hart's Tarsler became one of the most valued helpers at Northfield, both in the Mount Hermon School and at the several Northfield conferences, and Mr. Moody often referred in terms of warmest appreciation to that convention in Cleveland where he first met his friend. Over 300 visitors responded to the first call. Those who could not be accommodated in East Hall, the one dormitory building of the Northfield Seminary at this time, filled the resuscitation building and crowded the astonished town, some camping out in tents wherever a shelter corner could be found. The village church was scarcely large enough for a meeting place, and a large tent was pitched behind Mr. Moody's house. The second convention was held the year following, then owing to Mr. Moody's campaigns in Great Britain. There was an interval. They, they had been held without interruption every successive year during the early part of August. The second convention was held the year following, then owing to Mr. Moody's campaigns in Great Britain. There was an interval of three years, but since a third gathering in 1885, they have been held without interruption every successive year during the early part of August. The meetings of the first conference were largely devotional, study being uh, directed especially to the doctrines of the Holy Spirit. Many prayers were offered in behalf of the new institutions at Northfield, designed as they were to be distinctly a place for Christians' nurture and training school for Christian laborers. The meetings proved most impressive and fruitful. It is safe to say that in modern times, no such gatherings as the first Northfield Conference has been witnessed by Mr. Hartzler. Like the Jerusalem Pentecost, they were present devout men out of every nation under heaven, America, Europe, Asia, and Africa, had their representations. It was interesting to find brethren there from almost every state of the Union, from Mexico, Canada, England, Scotland, Wales, South Africa, Athens, Smyrna, Cappadocia, and many other lands and cities, pastors and evangelists, professors and editors, elders and deacons, devout women and earnest youth, and all with one accord in one place. Another remarkable feature of the convocation was the widespread interest and sympathy with the object of the gathering, which was manifested in hundreds of letters and telegrams that came pouring in from all parts of this and other lands. Mr. Moody began to receive these communications weeks before the meetings opened, and they kept coming by scores, even to the closing day. Christian associations, colleges, young ladies, semin seminaries, churches, camp meetings, women's prayer meetings, individual ministers, and laymen in almost every class and condition of Christian people were in communication with those present. It is especially noticeable that a large portion of the letters were from ministers of the various denominations. At the close of the ninth day, there were more than 3,000 requests for prayers piled up on Mr. Moody's desk. He had, had held them until that time, feeling that those present needed first to draw near to God in prevailing prayer for themselves before they began to pray for others. He learned also that meetings for the same object were being held in a number of places. He had no program for the meeting. At first, he took no leading part in the speaking, calling others to the front, but finally he yielded to the general desire to hear him and preach two or three sermons on the Holy Spirit. The main object of the conference, as set forth in the call, was so manifestly approved by God that it was steadily viewed, kept in view from beginning to end. The object was solemn self-consecration, pleading God's promises, and waiting on Him for a fresh anointing of power from on high.
Don't think of your homes, your family, your work, or your churches now, said Mr. Moody at one of the meetings. Don't pray for anything or anybody but yourself. Attend now to your own heart only. One day, a man arose who said that he had been five years on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mr. Moody cast a quick glance upon the speaker and flashed into his mind a sharp question. How many souls did you lead to Christ last year? Well, I don't know, was the astonished reply. Have you saved any? persisted Mr. Moody. I don't know that I have, answered the man with a, a depressed air. Well, said Mr. Moody, we don't want that kind of mountaintop experience. When a man gets up so high that he cannot reach down and save poor sinners, there is something wrong. Meetings were held in the seminary chapel and also daily in a large tent on a green knoll near Mr. Moody's house, later known as Round Top and now the burial place of the evangelist. The men met in this tent, and the women held their meetings in the seminary chapel. At the close of the morning meetings in the tent, other meetings were held in Bonar Glen, a shady raven under the trees and in the sem seminary. Too many of these meetings are still memorable and will be while well, life lasts. Dr. Hartzler refers to one meeting which he considered especially sacred. It was held in a large tent on a round top. Under common impulse, the little company of 26 clasped one another's hands, stood in a circle, and entered into a solemn covenant of consecration with God and with one another. Someone proposed that each one take a list of names and addresses of all, and that we pledge ourselves to pray daily for each one till death. No, said Mr. Moody, don't bind yourselves to that. Pray for one another, of course, but don't pledge yourself to do it every day. At least you are a burden, you are conscious, and make an irksome duty out of what should be a delightful privilege. Some words of caution spoken by Mr. Moody at the close of the meeting may well be recalled at this time. Don't go away and talk so much about these meetings as about Christ. The world needs Him. Every place where God leads, there is your field. Don't talk an inch beyond your experience. A holy life will produce the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow... No horns, they only shine. Confession should only extend to parties sinned against. Look out for the devil at the foot of the mountain. Among the interesting incidents of that meeting, which have been received from friends, too, are given. We were perhaps a hundred men seated on the clean straw under the tent at noon on Round Top. Mr. Moody was leading the conversation hour. He stood sturdily against the central tent pole. Out came the plump question. Brother, how many of you have so grown in grace that you can bear to have your faults towed? Many hands went up, quick as a flash, but not sharply or insultingly. Mr. Moody turned to a young Episcopal minister in front of him and said, Brother, have, you have spoken 13 times in three days here and perhaps shut out 12 other good men from speaking. It was true. The young man had been presuming and officialist. Mr. Moody fitted him fairly. He had held out his hand as one willing to be chided for fault, but he could not bear it. He owed no fault or sorrow, but stoutly defended himself, or tried to, only making his case really the worse. Then a real old Yankee vinegar face on the outer rim of a circle turned loose and sharply berated Moody for his bluntness. The good man blushed, but listened while the, until the abuse was over. Then... Suggestively covering his face, he spoke through his fingers. Brethren, I admit my fault. I admit all the faults my friend charges me. But, brethren, I did not hold up my hand. At one of these meetings for Christian workers, Mr. Moody presented a very high ideal for the ministry and spoke severely of those who failed in their sacred calling. His words were very pointed, and a young theologian who was present winced and spoke out ingenuously. Mr. Moody, I don't see any such ministers as you described. It was a frank and outspoken remonishment, but not rude. Quick as a flash came the retort. You are a young man yet. You will see many of them. Tarry in Jericho until your beard be grown. The reply was unjust and it hurt, yet there was too much life in the meeting for stopping. In writing of, of the scene, a friend says, it went on with a clear sense that the evangelist had dropped a little from his standard of loving courtesy to his guests. He could have ignored it. The tide of eloquency was full. Yet the most eloquent was to come. 
in my heart has ever since been writing, written a memory which brings moisture into my eyes yet and ranks itself unquestionably as the greatest thing I ever saw Moody do. Friends, he said, I answered my dear young friend over there very foolishly as I began this meeting. I asked God to forgive me, and I asked the forgiveness of my brother. And straightway he walked over to him and took him by the hand. The meeting needed no after meeting. It was dramatically and spiritually made perfect. The man of iron will prove that he had mastered the hardest words of all English languages. I am sorry. The many testimonies of blessing that resulted from the first conference led Mr. Moody to call a second gathering the following year, which continued through the entire month of August. Dr. Andrew A. Bernard was the leading speaker on the occasion, and his impressions are thus given in his diary recently published. August 4th, Northfield. Began yesterday, but especially today, the conference took shape. Was requested to open, which I did, from Exodus 34, Communion with God, a gathering of God's people from every quarter. August 13th, much exercised about getting power from on high, about which much conversation. I am rather disappointed that there is not more prayer throughout the day, but the atmosphere is delightful. So much brotherly love, so much biblical truth, so much delight in whatever exalts Christ. August 14th, preached on John 3.30. Mr. Moody as kind as possible and most earnest in all work. When Mr. Moody was abroad in 1892, Dr. A.J. Gordon of Boston had charge of the meetings in the following year when the World's Fair campaign engrossed all of Mr. Moody's energies, Dr. Gordon, assisted by H.M. Moore, again conducted the conference. In 1891, with Reverend F.B. Meyer of London, a prominent speaker of the Kenswick Conference in England, was president at Northfield, and the subjective side of Christian living received special prominence. There was no advocacy of sinless perfection, but a clear presentation of the possibilities of a life truly yielded to God and the privilege it afforded of living free from the bondage of sin. The message of this teacher was markedly fruitful in the lives and ministries of many who were present. Mr. Meyer returned in succeeding years, and other English speakers have laid great emphasis of late on this line of teaching, including, among others, Pen, Prependary, Webb, Pibla, Andrew Murray, and C. Campbell Morgan. There again, Mr. Moody showed the sound judgment that guided his work, for he refused to limit the Northfield work to any one phase of Christian truth. Northfield was to be representative of all the truth contained in God's word, and, with, and while giving due prominence to the importance of subjective dealing, he accompanied it with lectures from the leading American ministers on methods of Christian work, Bible interpretation, and all the varied experiences of a wide and charitable conception of Christian thought and activity. Missionary interests have been present, is present by representatives of all lands, while city, frontier, and evangelistic work have received the due recognition they deserve. The wisdom of this course is amply proved by the continued growth of these conferences and many testimonies received from those who have been blessed in attending them. For years, Stone Hall, the recitation hall of the Northfield Seminary, was used as the audience room for the summer conferences, but in time, this became overcrowded, and in 1894, the beautiful auditorium on the crest of the hill, overlooking the campus, was erected primarily for these gatherings. I have always tried to build according to my faith, said Mr. Moody on the opening night. This time, my friends think my faith has carried me away. They do not believe that I shall ever see this building full. Within a week, on the first Sunday morning, seats, platforms, stairwells, and aisles were filled with an audience numbering about 3,000, and this experience has been repeated every year. The following call, dated June 1, 1899, was the last one that Mr. Moody issued. Dear friends and fellow workers, the 17th General Conference of Christian Workers will be held at Norfield, August 1st to 20th. And all of God's people who are interested in the study of His Word and the development of their own Christian lives in a revival of the spiritual life of the church and the conversion of sinners and in the evangelization of the world are cordially invited to be present. 
I am glad to send out this invitation to my fellow workers because I believe that such a gathering was never more needed than this year. Many thoughtful men have come to feel strongly that the hope of the church today is in a deep and widespread revival. We are confronted with difficulties that can be met in no other way. The enemy has come in like a flood. It is time for those who believe in a supernatural religion to look to God to lift up a standard against him. Oh, for a revival of such power that the tide of unbelief and worldliness that is sweeping in among us shall be beaten back, and every Christian shall be lifted to a higher level of life and power, and multitudes of perishing souls be converted to God. Why not? God's arm is not shortened, nor his ear heavy. I believe the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees may already be heard. The history of revivals proves that such a work must begin at the house of God. Who can doubt that if somehow the church could be thoroughly aroused, not a mere scratching of the surface of our emotions, but a deep heart work that shall make us right with God and clothe us with power in prayer and service, the last months of this century would witness the mightiest movements of the Holy Spirit since Pentecost. The whole aim of this conference is to help bring this about. Why need any pastor or church fail to share in the blessing? How sad the experience of that worker who sees others greatly used in such a movement in himself pass by. All the fields rejoicing with the joy of harvest, while his still lies barren and unfruitful. It need not be so. Let us break up our fallow ground, seek a fresh anointing of the Spirit, and then move forward, expecting great things of God. We are to have with us some of the most widely known teachers of this country and England, men on whom labor, labor's God has already set his seal. There will be the great help that comes from call close contact with hundreds of earnest men and women, almost all of them engaged in some form of Christian work. The accommodations for boarding are amped and pleasant, and the expense moderate. I shall be glad to hear from all who are planning to come. May I not ask Christian workers to begin now to pray for the special outpouring of the Spirit upon every meeting of the conference? Yours in the Master's Servant, D.L. Moody. In response to this invitation, the largest gathering ever held at Northfield met during the first three weeks of August. The Presbytery of New York engaged Weston Hall, and 60 of its pastors and members were, engaged in, were entertained there, several accompanied by their wives. Three or four of the leading pastors of the city were among the speakers at the auditorium and on the round top. During the last August conference, Mr. Moody started a new work in establishing a, a week's conference for young people in which he had the hearty cooperation of John Willis uh, Bear, B-A-E-R, of the United Society of Christian Endeavor. This gathering aimed to reach young people in the churches and by informal conferences advised the best, best method of work. In another chapter, we have alluded to the development of the student conferences. The marked result of this gathering, as well as that of the August conference, led the officers of the Young Women's Christian Association to institute a conference for young women online similar to that of young men. This met for the first time in 1893 and has steadily increased in attendance and influence with succeeding years. The leading women's colleges are represented at this gathering by large delegations as well as many of the leading young women's Christian Association. A new feature was introduced in 1899 which gave Mr. Moody great encouragement and suggested a new phase of Northfield work. The Lowell Young Women's Christian Association had set, sent a large delegation to the conferences and in the winter of 1898-99 it was proposed by the Secretary, Miss Louise Pearson, to erect a house where 25 or 30 young women could live at a slight expense and enjoy the advantages of Northfield. Between the seminary and Northfield Hotel, accordingly, Lowell Lodge was erected and opened on August 15, 1899. Twenty-five self-supporting young women occupied this building during the Bible conferences. Some of them boarded themselves, paying a dollar a week for lodging, but the majority had their meals at the lodging, which cost two or three dollars additional. In this address at the dedication, Mr. Moody said, I am more than pleased with what has been accomplished here. We give the land very gladly because we believe it is going to open up a new plan, which I hope will be a great blessing not only to the town of Norfield, but to the country. If people see that such a house can be put up for $1,000, for 
Some of them will duplicate this one. We will furnish the land for nothing. If girls come here from Lowell and get stirred up by God's Spirit so that they go back and carry a blessing to others, we shall be a thousand times repaid for the little poultry land that we gave. We don't want a city in Norfield. We want to spread out. There is no reason why the whole mountainside should not be built up. The greatest trouble we have is to entertain the people who come here. You can imagine that to have 1,200 extra people in a little town like this, as we have had for the last few days, makes somebody work. Now, if people will undertake to put up houses where they can board themselves, it will be a great relief. In that way, they can get a room and live on bread and milk and blueberries for about $2 a week. We don't ask them to come here to pulper the body, but to feed the soul. I believe the blessing of God is going to rest upon this building and those who come here. I think Norfield is just about as near paradise as we can get on earth.